Good evening. You have crossed the threshold point. Behind you is the world you know, a world of sanity and certainty. Before you now is the vast, uncharted wilderness of the mind. In this blackened realm of hungry beasts and swirling specters, you will walk across floors of shattered glass and stumble into serrated edges. You will be vivisected by ferocious machines and probed by cybernetic inquisitors. Here is the brutal chaos of the imagination, the wondrous worlds and limitless prisons of the psyche. You are in here with us now. Welcome to Dark Therapy. They Only Want to Help by Jordan Owen, copyright 2016. After nearly a decade's absence, the hands returned in February of his 32nd year. He was Louis Nykem and had been close to forgetting the hands in the great war he had waged all those years ago when they emerged from beneath his bed. It was a lush, comforting bed, one with an extra soft pad on the top that he could sink into and let the wild machinations of his heart fade into cottony obscurity. He had never learned what caused the hands to emerge, but he knew that quelling his heartbeat would keep them at bay. Electric pulses of unbridled consternation shot up the exploding pathways of his nerves, and in that instant his eyes were open. The hands were coming. He didn't move, didn't dare wake Becky as she slept sharply next to him. To say the hands were leathery was inaccurate. They were leather, as though the outer dermis had been replaced with car seat covering. The hands were cold and smooth as they crept up the sides of the bed and held on first to his wrists and ankles and then his neck and the back of his head. He forced himself not to look down at the arms, those elongated limbs that had as many joints as they needed to slink out from beneath the bed and ensnare him. The first night of what he would come to think of as the New War was brief but harrowing. It had been a quiet announcement that they had returned. After a time, the hands released him, and his sleep was labored and filled with dreams of snakes. As they dressed in the morning, Lewis could not detect Becky's words. They were ambient pulses against the factory hum of his distressed thoughts. The cuffs of his shirt stung his swollen wrists as he buttoned them, and his necktie rubbed sorely against his Adam's apple. It was enough to make Becky's distant words grate like tiny iron filings against his nerves. "'Can't you see the hands have returned?' he bellowed, spinning around to confront Becky. But when the red cleared from his eyes, he saw that she was still sitting in front of her makeup mirror, talking and heedless of his outburst. Work whinged by at a lethargic pace, the once vibrant world of corporate marketing withered by the knowledge that the hands had returned. There was a meeting, one where Lewis found himself at the far end of a long rectangular table while a prematurely balding middle manager named Nathan attempted to instill enthusiasm for quarterly projections into a cross-section of loyal payons. As the middle manager named Nathan droned on, Lewis quietly clutched the arm of his chair as he felt five long, slender fingers close around his ankle. He didn't need to look down. He already knew that a hand had emerged from beneath the table. Another closed around his foot, and a third and fourth gripped his wrists. As still more hands wrapped around his chest, squeezing his breath down to a trickle, his eyes flashed across the faces in the room, each festooned with practiced indifference. Nathan turned to Lewis just as a final set of hands closed across his mouth. There was a statement made, something that turned the attention of the entire room to his trapped state. Lewis's eyes flicked from one face to another, but they all stared back impassively, nobody jumping to life to set him free. He screamed out in agony, but all that emerged was a muffled moan. I agree, said Nathan after a moment. Lewis has a point. Does anyone else notice any other anomalies on our fourth quarter numbers? The hands released him just long enough for him to return to his desk, but crept along behind him all the way down the hall. At dinner that night, he looked on with weary strain as Becky sat across from him at the pseudo-posh Ikea landscape of their dining room table, babbling endlessly. She recited, as she always did, the commentary-rich transcript of the ongoing soap opera that was her day at work. 
It was a world assembled through the warped lens of petty minutia where friends became enemies and back again in the space of a latte. Throughout his eating of the evening's roast beef and carrots, Lewis found himself checking beneath the slab of compressed particle board for the beginnings of the hands. They were dormant, but he knew they would return that night. Before climbing into bed, Lewis went into his closet and unearthed the sword he'd used to fight the Great War. Its sheath was covered in dust, but he could still read the gilded inscription, Take Two Tablets by Mouth at Bedtime. He removed the sheath and stared into the sterling grandeur of the blade. The weight was not unfamiliar, but it still felt imbalanced. There was a sense of a bobbing transfer of heaviness between the blade and his arms. He swung the instrument through some of the old combinations and found that he still retained much of his combat training. Like riding a bicycle, he thought to himself. He was in the midst of imagining the cold steel eviscerating the leathery hands when he heard a tiny voice say, Don't hurt them. He turned to see himself as a child standing piteously in a set of footy pajamas. They only want to help, said the child. Lewis stared into the wide, sad eyes of his child self and dropped the blade to the ground, where he too soon collapsed, weeping. He did not notice the hand that emerged to drag the sword beneath the bed. The hands opened his chest that night. Two held the blade expertly, while a dozen more held him in place. The blade, once that last great bastion of comfort and protection, had been re-engineered as the tool that carved down the center of his chest in a single resonant slice. Still another set of hands emerged from beneath the bed to peel back the layer of flesh spilling plasma out across the desert of his chest. Lewis Nykam screamed with ravenous abandon against the hands that were clenched over his mouth as the sword-wielding hands dug into his ribcage. There was a dazzling new texture to the pain of having his ribcage eviscerated, as though strips of sunlight were being dipped in acid and used to wallpaper his central nervous system. When the cutting was complete, there was a jagged chasm from the manubrium down to the xiphoid process. Though his nerves seared with pain that informed him in sterling detail why Christopher Hitchens had said that the first presentation stage of esophageal cancer felt like having cement poured into one's chest cavity, Lewis Nykam could only sob as still another pair of hands emerged and slipped their slender fingers into the evisceration. The electric ribbons of pain shot down his spine as his clavicle burst through the back wall of his flesh and his ribs crumbled against his backbone. Blood splashed onto the bed in torrents. For a series of withering moments, Lewis watched as his heart pounded and his lungs expanded and contracted, the plasma-stained interior he was never meant to see. The hands reached in and extracted his lungs, heart, and stomach, laying them on either side of his torso. In the wake of his organs was a gutted valley of smooth, raw meat interrupted by the tattered shaft of his spine. It was onto this spinal column that one of the hands set a miniature swing set with two tiny seats suspended by strings. Another hand placed the child version of Lewis, which was now shrunk into a size appropriate for the swing set, down into the chest cavity. The elder Lewis stared on, with eyes and mind reeling as his miniature self sat on one of the seats and began to swing back and forth. See, said the child with a tiny, cheerful voice, they only want to help. The next day was Saturday, and Lewis Nykam took a trip out of the city and into the wooded outer regions where he'd first fought the Great War. It was a pleasant autumn, and the roads were ensconced in the crumpled gold-to-orange gradient smear of fallen leaves. Lewis found himself enjoying the smoky crispiness of the air that wafted in through the driver's side window. For that moment, he forgot all about the reasons for his journey and was lost in the travel itself until a single hand emerged from beneath the passenger's side seat and gently stroked his ankle. In time, he arrived in that vast, sculpted wasteland called Suburbia. It had been here, in a house on 380 Wickerberry Lane, where the war had first been fought. He couldn't understand why the hands would come to attack a mere child, but he understood their method, to come out from under the bed. No adult would have thought anything of that. After all, every kid worries about monsters under the bed.
He had hoped to find in the familiar setting a remnant of the childhood self that had been more easily comforted than he was now. Despite all the pain and all the terror, just the bright summer sun glistening on the fresh-cut grass had been enough to soothe him back in those days. Over the years, the grass had seemed less shiny, no matter how sunny a day it was. As he pulled into the driveway, Lewis cast his eyes about for that vibrancy from his childhood, but it just wasn't there. The paint job on the house had retained the same hue that it always had, but it didn't have that passionate resonance that it did when he was a child. His mother was happy to see him, as always, and greeted him with a warm hug, but there was a hollowness to it. The warm glow that had once transmitted from mother to child, recharging the batteries of his beleaguered self-esteem, was nowhere to be found. After pleasantries were concluded and they moved to seats in the living room, he explained in halting tones that the Great War had to be fought again and that the hands had returned. His mother nodded and was silent for a time before she finally said, Well, I know you don't like to hear this, but you need to go talk to your... And she went on to tell him that he needed to seek out the old generals and the old soldiers that had helped him wage the first great war. But if those generals had not been able to fully eradicate the enemy, there was no point in summoning them again. He sat and listened to his mother with strained but polite poise, and all the while a hand emerged from beneath the sofa, gashed open his stomach, and began stirring his stomach acid until it was spraying all over the room like a lidless blender. His mother appeared not to notice. That night, Louis Nykem slept in his childhood bed for the first time in a very long time, a sort of scarcely patronized shrine to the sweet little boy he had once been. There had been a time when the sight of this room, pristinely maintained and exhibited, had given him a sense of calm and peace. It was the knowledge that no matter how far the perpetually distant mistress of time pushed him to betray the purity of that sweet little boy, he could always return here to cleanse his conscience. He sat down on the bed and let his eyes cast across the Zenith television with the 8-bit Nintendo tucked neatly underneath, the row of Power Ranger action figures arranged pink, blue, red, black, yellow like the original promotional materials had dictated, the Charlie Brown cyclopedias that he had gotten one at a time from the grocery store, first Bruno's in Birmingham, Alabama, then Kroger in Roswell, Georgia. Then there was the wicker basket filled with his collection of McDonald's Happy Meal toys. He had full sets of the Fraggle Rock racers, the Berenstain Bears with their little push carts, the McNuggets dressed in the uniforms of various worthwhile careers, the McDonald's character wind-up toys that would shoot off across the room when pulled back a few times, the Transformers that turned from McDonald's food products into towering machines of destruction and back again, those little miniature Viewmaster camera things that had been released to promote Disney's The Rescuers Down Under, and countless other bric-a-brac from the assembly line of capitalist pandering that had been his childhood. There was just one piece missing, the stuffed Snoopy doll that had been his constant companion throughout his childhood, that one item that had been so important that he'd taken it with him when he first moved away from home in his first years as an adult. There had been moderate flooding in the first house he'd lived in, and when he'd moved, he'd found the Snoopy doll heavily waterlogged and thrown it away. At the time, it felt like a swift and defiant act of a type A man, but in all the years since, he felt like Tom Hanks in Castaway, screaming in agony as the volleyball that had been his only friend on the island drifted away into the oceanic currents. The thoughts of losing the Snoopy doll that had been his quiet and comforting companion through the tender trials and tribulations of his childhood filled Lewis Nykum with a sense of loss that had him rocking on his bed with his chin against his knees. The pangs of loss and guilt crashed on the rocky ridges of what had been his soul. As those blasts of sorrow struck like bolts of lightning, he heard the words, They only want to help. He looked up but didn't see the little boy anywhere. The room was dark save for the gentle glow of the taxicab shaped nightlight that sat on the blue bedside nightstand. There was a moment's silence as the words echoed in his ears like a wind filled with rust made gaseous, but that silence was shattered by the sound of three bed springs creaking. 
He looked down to his right and saw that a hand had emerged from beneath his bed. Louis Nykam scoured his brain for some new thread. There had to have been something different. What was different from the last great war? It was the child. There had never been another version of himself projected into the midst of the battle. The child was the difference, and in realizing that, a railroad switch flipped in his mind, and he saw the diplomatic path out of the next great war. His thoughts were interrupted by a knocking on his door, one wholly unfamiliar to him as though he were being summoned by some stern but restrained inquisitor. He didn't have time to answer before the door was opened. His mother was there, flanked by two men who would have passed for bouncers at a nightclub were it not for their white-on-white uniforms. One of them held a needle. It's okay, his mother said. They only want to help. Having no other exit, Lewis reached out for the hand from beneath the bed. For the first time ever, he reciprocated the outreach and looked on as though spellbound, as leather that was cold on the surface and warm beneath closed into his grasp. They were now comrades. Allegiances had shifted and battle lines were renegotiated. Lewis didn't fully understand the new bond of brotherhood, but for once one of the hands wasn't reaching out to inflict torment. He didn't resist when it started to pull. Following the appendage's lead, he lowered himself to the floor and lay down on his stomach, letting the hand pull him into the world beneath the bed. Where he had expected to see carpet and springs, and he instead found himself being pulled down a long, thick tunnel, whose enclosure was made of something akin to moist vaginal tissue. There was a thick, musky stench emanating from the moisture, but as he slid down the corridor, he found that there was also a tangy sweetness to it. The tunnel was lit by a dim light in the distance that made the beads of moisture glisten. As he slid ever closer, Lewis could see that the light was the dull blue of cathode rays. When he finally came through the other end of the vaginal tunnel, he found himself in a spherical room whose rounded walls were made of the same tissue as the corridor, but set into these walls were an array of television screens, each showing a repeating loop of one of Lewis Nykam's more grating memories. There were visions of all those interminable dinners listening to Becky, all the times he had been called on to make bullshit observations at staff meetings, all the times he had had the opportunity to get laid with nymphomaniacal co-eds in college but back down because of a sudden sense of shame, all the times he'd let opportunities for promotion slip through his fingers because he was afraid he'd throw up in front of the corporate bigwigs if he went out drinking with them, etc., etc. Those monitors bore on endless repeat the hundreds of memories of lives not lived and chances not taken. They were the plethora of pointlessness that had led to his current state of bland ennui. No wonder the hands had returned. He'd been in desperate need of the stimulation. In the middle of it all were the hands, a dense web of them, all attached to arms that ran down into the floor. He had wanted to see the termination point, the beast or beasts that commanded them all, but it was not to be seen. Instead, the hands, as though leaves on a leather tree, hung from the multi-jointed arms that sprang up from the tissue of the floor, as if from expanded pores. The hand that had dragged him here sank back among its brothers, quickly becoming lost among them. They hovered there for a long instant, bobbing as if to suggest that a chilly wind blew through them, then all at once moving in synchronized unison to form a wide canopy, revealing that the child version of Louis Nykam stood among them. At first, Louis was oddly mortified when the child stepped towards him. After a moment, his nerves softened, but he still willed himself not to break down and cry again. He looked down at the child who repeated the mantra, They only want to help. Can you say anything else? Lewis asked. The child nodded. Okay, so how are they supposed to help? They've been torturing me all of my goddamn life. And on the word life, the hands smoothly shifted into a new arrangement, the arms and hands now interlocking to form a chair. Please, said the child, sit. Lewis approached the chair with throbbing reluctance, his body sinking into the surprisingly comfortable throne. 
The hands lifted him off the ground to show him the televisions. One by one, he was carried past each one, and upon looking closer, he could see that beneath them was a small LED readout panel that flashed, Ascendancy Sacrifice Required. Next to each panel was a slot adorned with a different image. One was of a nose, two were of eyes, two were of ears, a heart, lungs, ribcage, penis and testicles, femur, coccyx, appendix, tonsils, and so on. Louis Nykam was puzzled for an instant, then he understood. Once the chair was lowered back to the floor, he was unsurprised when a set of hands came around and handed him the sword. He rose from the chair and grabbed the child by the throat. Despite screaming in agony, the little boy was unafraid. The first thrust was filled with tears and regret, but once Lewis had extracted one of the eyeballs, he took it and fed it into the appropriate slot, and a rush of satiation poured through him like the first decadent sip of Gatorade after a long run on a hot day. The image on the screen changed from his passing on the girl that had wanted to fuck on the pool table in his college dorm to instead plunging his throbbing member into her moistened rose blossom. He stared in satisfaction at the image and realized that he no longer remembered the memory originally associated with it. Now the one screen seemed out of place. What was that one wonderful image doing in among all these horrid delusions? He ran to the child and extracted the next eye. He now no longer remembered getting chewed out by his boss at a company retreat and instead remembered and saw himself getting a promotion for breaking that son of a bitch's nose when one of the, when one of the VPs saw what had happened and appreciated Lewis's resolve. And on it went, a tongue to purge the memory of getting jumped on the playground by Henry Warnock in first grade and replace it with the satisfaction of putting Henry in traction. A liver to cleanse his heart and mind of the time in summer camp when the counselors had wrongly accused him of stealing and he'd given in, accepting the punishment because they just wouldn't let up. A clavicle to overwrite the long nights contemplating suicide to be replaced by productive evenings working on fortune-building patents and brilliant innovations for his company. By the time he was done, the televisions were showing nothing but a proud legacy of triumph. There was nothing left of the boy save for the blood that covered the spherical floor where it mixed with the silken vaginal moisture. Lewis gathered the thick crimson concoction in his hands and smeared it all over his face and chest. Lewis Nykam laughed. The laugh became a bellow, the ravenous elation of a predator at its finest and proudest kill. Years had passed since the Second Great War. It had been a war where alliances were forged across party lines that had previously been ironclad, and the outcome had come at the cost of much bloodshed, but also diplomacy. The Great Allegiance had led to extraordinary prosperity for Louis Nykam, whose business cards now said Senior Vice President after his name. His office, far from being lost in the sprawling labyrinthine network of cubicles, was now on the corner of one of the top floors of the building. He had an amazing view of the city. Mr. Nykam, said the melodious voice of his buxom secretary, your wife called to ask if you want stroganoff for dinner. Thanks, Francine, he replied. Tell her that sounds great. Of course, Mr. Nykam, she said, turning to leave. Oh, she paused, turning back to Lewis in the doorway. Are we still on for that four-way with your wife and the big-titted blonde from accounting this Saturday? Of course, replied Lewis again, and make sure you bring the saddle and riding crop this time. You got it, boss, said Francine in a voice a few degrees warmer than her usual business tone, just warm enough to ride on a wave of naughty lilt at the edge of her mouth. She closed the door behind her and Lewis Nykam refocused his attention on the documents on his desk. One of the hands emerged from beneath Lewis's desk and rose up to the height of his face. Lewis looked up just long enough to give the hand a comradely high five before getting back to his work.